But uh, first of all, I must welcome Dr. Heather Blasdell Clark. Heather is a dance teacher and cultural historian who's been actively involved in researching Australian colonial dance for over three decades, but she must have started terribly young in that case. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, um, her topics of interest have been dancing on board ships with the explorers, the convicts, the immigrants, and also besides that, the developing Anglo-Celtic tradition of step dancing within Australian, in the Australian context. She's had no fewer than six research scholarships and perhaps more by now. And uh, she regularly publishes her own views and others as well with lots of research material on her website. And I'm just going to put the website in the chat. I think I've still got it. Yes, there it is. If anybody would like to make a note of it and look it up afterwards. And so now it's over to Heather and I'm sure we're all going to really enjoy her very wide ranging talk about dance on board ship. Thank you very much, Sharon. I'm, I'm delighted to be part of the Early Dance Circles Online Festival for 2021. Today I'm going to talk about dancing on board ship. Maritime history abounds with stories about dancing, yet these stories are not commonly known and not necessarily easy to locate. I've been fascinated by this subject for many years and today I'm going to share some of the information I've discovered. As soon as ships became large enough to include a reasonable sized deck, people probably started dancing on them. Some of the earliest accounts come from the journals of explorers. It's usually easier to find information about the musical instruments on ships and musicians in the crews rather than references to dancing. So we'll look at this to begin with. We know that for the majority of ships, there would be usually a few men in the crew who could play musical instruments. We have an astounding example of this from King Henry's warship, the Mary Rose. This sank in 1545 and it was recovered in 1992. During the very meticulous recovery program, a number of musical instruments were found. This is one of the fiddles. In total, they found two fiddles and a bow, a shorn, which was a predecessor to the oboe, several three-hole pipes and a tabor drum with a drumstick. Moving forward to 1582, we have an account from Richard Hawkins, who made a voyage across the Atlantic from Guinea to the West Indies. He noted taking trumpeters, musicians and weights for his long voyage. Curiously, he didn't consider trumpeters to be musicians since he listed them separately. <laughs> Francis Drake voyage around the world in the Pelican in 1577. He carried a rich variety of musical instruments and the men to play them. Evidently, these musicians weren't necessarily highly regarded. Captain Woods Rogers in 1712 listed fiddlers in the same category as tinkers, tailors, haymakers and peddlers. In the Navy, the Marines provided drummers and pipers for shipboard music. The first Marine Corps was raised in 1664 and here's an illustration of a band of musicians in 1825. And you can see that they have quite a range of, of instruments, quite a selection. It seems more often that fiddlers came from the crew and that they supplied the music for dancing. The musicologist Ian Woodfield states that by far the most important duty of seagoing fiddlers was playing for jigs and other popular dance tunes for members of the crew. If you're interested more in this um, aspect of music, I can highly recommend Ian Woodfield's book, 
English musicians in the age of exploration. The first account of dancing on board English ships that I found is from John James. He sailed with John Davis, one of Queen, Vic Queen Elizabeth's first chief navigators. In 1585, they went in search of the Northwest Passage. And James describes how the English sailors danced and ran races with the Eskimos, how the sailors could jump higher, but how the Eskimos were more than their match in wrestling. Coming forward almost a hundred years, there's a very special story from 17, 1671. This comes from a ship called St. David's. This picture shows a ship from the same year, so they probably looked similar. John Balthorpe was a Navy clerk on board the ship who wrote a po poem called The Straits Voyage or St. David's Poem, being a description of the most remarkable passages that happened in her first expedition against the Turks of Algiers. And he is a part of the poem. Our fiddler did in triumph fetch his fiddle from aboard a ketch called the Portsmouth, and did play oft times to pass the time away, sometimes to pass said cares away. On forecastle we dance the hay, sometimes dance nothing, only hop about. It's for good dancing passes amongst the rout. Yet on my word, I have seen sailors more nimble dance than any tailors. This is a really wonderful account because it gives us so much detail. They dance the hay and at other times just hopped about. And the remark about sailors being nimble dancers, better even than tailors. And notice the very revealing line, sometimes to pass sad cares away. This is very much a key element in dancing at sea, as we'll discuss later. Another insight into sailors and dancing comes from the English pirate explorer, William Dampier. He wrote a travelogue of his adventures in the South Seas that was a bestseller. It was said to inspire Oliver Swift to write Gulliver's Travels and Daniel Defoe to write Robinson Crusoe. Uh, this picture's a bit of an aside. I just think it's lovely. It's, it's an illustration of um, Robinson Crusoe teaching his cats and goats how to dance. You can see them springing around there. <laughs> I think is lovely. Uh, going back to Dampier, he was the first Englishman known to set foot in Australia, and there's a country dance bearing his name that was published four times by Walsh. Dampier wrote that his men couldn't read or write, but had learned to dance and play music in the music houses in Wapping, the dockside area of London. This is a, a fairly romantic illustration of music and dancing from a play called The Humours of a Wapping Landlady in 1743. I expect the real thing looked a little bit um, more raucous than that. We know music and dancing was also used by many explorers in cultural exchanges when they needed to approach strangers in their travels. This is an illustration from Bontico's memorable description of the East Indian voyage, 1618 to 25. When he visited Madagascar, the local people were astonished by the music of the fiddle and they snapped their fingers, danced and capered and rejoiced right merrily. It was recognized quite early that it was an excellent way to signal a peaceful intention when people couldn't communicate verbally. It was particularly important when travelers needed fresh food and water. It was imperative that they didn't engage in fighting because if the explorers lost any of the members of their crews, they wouldn't be able to sail the ship properly. A few examples of explorers who use dance in this way include Columbus, 
Abel Tasman, Admiral Byron and Captain Cook. James Cook is the navigator who is credited with mapping more of the world than any other man. It was noted that he used dance in cultural exchanges across the Pacific. He was given a list of hints by the president of the Royal Society, the Earl of Morton, suggesting that they use soft airs rather than trumpets when approaching new people. We know on his first voyage, Cook had at least one musician, a fiddler, while on subsequent voyages, he was able to provide a full band of musicians to entertain the locals. And this was something that the Admiral uh, endorsed and they made sure that he had plenty of musicians to take with him. And this included the bagpipes, which proved to be very popular with the people of Tahiti. Most of the information about these encounters focuses on the dancing of the South Sea Islanders, as you can see here. Um, but also documented was the fact that his men danced hornpipes and country dances, both for their own enjoyment and to entertain. Cook was an enlightened captain who understood that dancing was not only useful in cultural exchanges, but also incredibly useful for keeping his crew in good health. The dance historian Carlo Blasis wrote in the 1820s that Cook wisely thought that dancing was of special use to sailors. This famous navigator, wishing to counteract disease on board his vessels as much as possible, took particular care in warm, in calm weather to make his sailors and marines dance to the sound of a violin. And it was to this practice that he mainly ascribed the sound health which his crew enjoyed during voyages of several years continuance. Well, I think that's a very interesting claim that um, Blessis is making there. I think there were some other things um, that he ascribed to the sound health of his crew, such as um, a healthy diet and um, ventilation and cleanliness on the ship. But it's interesting that, um, that Blassies had written that account. Dancing was a regular activity on board the ships in the Royal Navy. However, it wasn't necessarily documented, as is often the case with commonplace activities. People don't bother writing about it. One exception to this comes from Admiral Edward Boscowan. He wrote a letter to his wife at home, Fanny, in the spring of 1755. As he crossed the Atlantic, he wrote that every evening when the weather was fine, this, this, his men would dance to fiddle, fife and drum. This reminded him fondly of the country dances that he'd enjoyed with his wife. The historian A.M. Roger wrote about the importance of music and dance as a source of entertainment and exercise for the seamen, stating that one of the dangers on long voyages was the tedium of the lifestyle. No matter how well maintained the discipline on board, Sheer boredom was known to be the primary cause of discontent, hostility, and even outright mutiny. Dancing was known to alleviate these bad feelings. As mentioned earlier, it drove away sad cares. There's one famous example when this failed dramatically. William Bly had sailed with Cook on his final voyage into the Pacific. Bly was the master of the resolution and had experienced Cook's leadership and seen the success of his approach to dis discipline. He'd seen the way that Cook had cared for his crew. Some years later, when Bly was given command of the bounty, he made sure a fiddler called Michael Byrne was signed on. But Bly made the mistake of forcing his men to dance with the notion that it was essential for their good health. 
If they failed to comply, you would cut down their ration of grog completely. It's one of the things that's thought to have contributed to the mutiny. You'll be interested to know that there was a special tune that was played in the Navy to announce the daily issue of the grog ration. And I'm sure many of you will recognize it. Now let's see if we can get it to play properly. Yes. Nancy Dawson. Nancy was a famous actress who'd become spectacularly famous when she danced a hornpipe in the Beggar's Elf Opera at the Theatre Royal Covent Garden in 1759. Sometimes there wasn't a musician on board. Bly wrote that he had experienced great difficulty in finding a fiddler to join his crew perhaps because it promised to be a particularly long voyage. This is an illustration of a musician called Joseph Emedy. He had begun life as a slave in Africa, but had become a valued violinist for the Lisbon Opera. On a visit to the opera by the English Admiral Edward Pellew, Emedy was identified as a potential shipboard musician. Pelu and his officers hatched a plan to kidnap Emedy to furnish music for the sailors dancing in their evening leisure, a recreation highly favourable to the preservation of their good spirits and contentment. Evidently, Emedy loved playing Gluck, Haydn and Mozart, and loathed and detested playing hornpipes, jigs and reels. Happily for him, after four years, he was able to escape from the indefatigable and he went on to become the leader of the Churro Philharmonic Orchestra. Other captains used more ethical ways to obtain musicians and sometimes hired their own bands. It was also quite common for officers to play musical instruments as this image of midshipman show you can see is one of them's playing a, a flute once i think that's a fiddle held in a rather strange way and in the corner you can see somebody playing something as a wind instrument not quite sure what that is it's hard to identify but um it's quite well documented that the flute was very popular among midshipmen at that time Becoming a ship's fiddler was often a role taken on by sailors who had suffered a disability and could no longer carry out their regular duties. The fiddler on the bounty, Michael Byrne, had been listed as being two thirds blind. This is an illustration of the famous Billy Waters. Billy was a former Royal Navy sailor who had lost his leg falling from a topsail yard arm. Following this accident, he made his living playing fiddle on the streets of London, rather than returning to shipboard life. There are also plenty of able-bodied seamen who were also musicians, though they weren't generally paid an additional wage. This is a, a fiddler on Nelson's ship celebrating the famous victory. Moving on into the 19th century further, one of the most remarkable elements of dance research is the way information can be found in the most surprising places. One of these is in the medical journals of surgeons in charge of convicts who are being transported to Australia. Some of these surgeons actively encouraged the prisoners to dance 
recognising that it was the best activity to keep them in good health. One surgeon even wrote that it could bring convicts tranquility of mind. It stopped depression and it caused them to be better behaved generally. It meant there were fewer fights below decks and the convicts were easier to manage. The regime established by the Convict Transport Board, which included daily exercises on the deck, was so successful that it was safer to take the long voyage as a convict to Australia than it was to take the much shorter voyage to America as a free settler. Which leads us to emigrant ships. The experiences for people choosing to migrate could be vastly different depending on their finances. And this was also reflected in the types of dancing they enjoyed. This is an account from the clipper ship, the White Star, which traveled from Liverpool to England. Um, let me say that again. It traveled from Liverpool in England to Melbourne in Australia in 1855 with 600 emigrants. The White Star Journal was printed during the, the course of the voyage. It was printed every week and there are many references to dancing in it. One of the most revealing is this one that says, sometimes three distinct parties may be seen, each dancing their own measure to their own music. Quadrilles in the poop, polka in the waist, and a rattling Irish jig before the main mast. A few years earlier in 1850, the Emigrant Voyager's Manual recommended that uneducated passengers could use the abundance of time to improve themselves, and dancing was listed as one of the healthy activities they could practice. There are various references to so-called uneducated people dancing. On the convict ship, the Speedy, in 1799, the governor's wife, Anna King, noticed that some of the convict women enjoyed dancing and her tone is typical of uh, genteel observers at the time. She wrote, the ladies seemed all very happy and by way of a treat, they had a little dance for about two hours. It was much amusement for us to look at them. Some attempted Irish, others Scotch steps. And in truth, I could scarcely, scarcely make out any sort of steps, but a country jump. In 1858, on the emigrant ship Conway, Fanny Davis kept a diary in which she wrote, In one of the corners, there will be about two dozen singing. In another, a lot talking scandal about everybody. In another place, there will be a lot of Scotch girls dancing with one of them imitating the bagpipes and not one of them with either shoes or stockings on. Scandals. The Irish often seem to attract attention. Forward between the decks were the quarters of the bachelor immigrants. Here a tall sinewy Irishman was dancing a jig to the tune of a violin the scraping of which combined with the mewing of a litter of black kittens and the laughter of the audience to make up a very babel of discordant sounds. There's a, a fascinating two-edged insight from a semi-privileged observer as he describes the polka on a voyage in 1854. Our London dancing does not amuse the Cornish or Dev Devon people much. Most of them are minors. They sneers and laughs at seeing the polka dance. But of course we took no notice, as we guessed they had never seen it dance before. So we computed it to be their ignorance. I even heard one young woman say to another other, they call that dancing. I should like to take them by the heads and drop them overboard. And here's uh, another amusing anecdote which describes 
a distinct type of dance well known to those who take to the sea. Then there was music, for all the pots in the cabin began to jostle each other, then set to dancing a sort of country jig. This soon grew tame for some of them, and after a preliminary fling or two, they leapt over the wooden borders to the table and danced fandango in the middle of the cabin, showing that even pots and pans can take up dancing in inclement weather at sea. Of course, for the more privileged classes, dancing on board took on a completely different perspective. Balls were very special events on ships, and this is an illustration of a ball on the deck of the HMS Rattlesnake, showing how it could be successfully transformed into a beautiful ballroom. It was common practice for largest ships, especially those conveying important people, to give quite elaborate balls when they visited a foreign port. The highly polished decks of naval ships were perfect for dancing, especially in locations where ballrooms hadn't been constructed. This is a naval ball given by the officers of the Orlando in the Mujura. Sometimes these high society events would be celebrated with specially composed music for dancing. In this case, the Orlando Waltz. You can see there it's dedicated to the rear admiral. The custom of dance and music being devised to celebrate seafaring was nothing new. Going back to the 18th century, we have the English country dance for the explorer William Dampier, which was published in Wolf, as I mentioned earlier, to capitalize capitalize on the success of Dampier's travelogue. Other explorers were also celebrated in dance. Lord Anson, La Perouse, and Captain Cook, to name just a few. The names of famous captains and admirals were also often captured in dance titles, such as Lord Howe's Duke, Lord Collingwood's Hornpipe, and Nelson's Waltz. Dancers were also composed to celebrate successful naval battles. The glorious 1st of June, Admiral Rodney's triumph, and Nelson's victory. We mentioned Admiral Boscowan earlier, and this is his frolic, composed to celebrate his naval victory. Now we have the tune for this, so let me just get that moving. sprightly tune and we do dance that one from time to time. It's quite jolly. In the 19th century, dance music was composed for ships to celebrate their speedy passages. The Chusan Waltz celebrated the first Royal Mail steamer from Great Britain to Australia, which made the voyage in record time, almost half the time it took for a sailing ship. The Chusan made the run to Sydney in 80 days, carrying mails and passengers. And the citizens were so delighted on her arrival that they created a new dance tune called the Chusan Waltz. And of course, quadrilles encouraged all manner of maritime themes. The Trafalgar quadrilles, the Jack Tar quadrilles, the British Sailors Quadrille and the Lookout Quadrille, to name just a few. Everyone dancing these would have enjoyed the jaunty and well-loved tunes 
and you can easily imagine the dancers taking full advantage of the stirring music. And now to the theatre. As a maritime nation, the British love the sea, ships and sailors. And what better place to enjoy the culture than on the stage? This is the aquatic theatre at Sadler's Wells, where a large tank of water was constructed that covered the entire stage. Naval battles, shipwrecks and drowning sailors all were depicted on the stage. And of course, these dramas often included dancing. Um, in a, a, a little aside, they um, often used children as drowning sailors because the water was a bit shallow for, for adults. So they would throw children in so they would flounder around and look a bit more authentic. It's completely ethical, of course. Um, so moving on. In 1788, the grand pantomimic ballet of the death of Captain Cook was published in Paris, with an English version opening the following year in Covent Garden. This obviously featured a great deal of dancing, and at least one of the scenes was devoted to sailors. Seafaring was a popular in, and enduring theme in the theatre, particularly as the Royal Navy gained supremacy and theatrical works in varying, invariably included sailor dancing. This is a picture of the famous actor Thomas Cook, who specialised in acting the role of a sailor. In the late 19th century, the famous comic opera HMS Pinafore, or The Lass That Loved a Sailor, by Gilbert and Sullivan took to the stage, and this continues to be popular to this day and often includes um, much uh, hornpipe type dancing because the dance most represented in the theatre is the sailor's hornpipe. In 1829, Yeats, who was an English dancing master, wrote that few English seamen were to be found who were not acquainted with the hornpipe, and some indeed danced it in perfection. He noted that schoolboys destined for a naval career made a point of learning the hornpipe, and during the 19th century it was included in the training of naval cadets. Such was its popularity that it was labelled as the National Dance of England. The origins of the hornpipe were uncertain. This is an illustration of the instrument which gave the tune and the dance its name. It's thought to have originated as a stage dance, which was then adapted as an occupational dance for sailors. I'm a little sceptical about this explanation. It would have just as easily developed the other way, I believe, and it's so long ago it's unlikely that we'll ever know for sure. Uh, the early hornpipes were in triple time, so that's 3-2, and in the mid 18th century they developed with a new rhythm in common time, 4-4, four, four, with a distinctive da, 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 punctuating the end of each phrase. As an occupational dance, it portrays activities in the daily working life as of a sailor, such as looking out to sea, hauling and coiling ropes, pumping and climbing the rigging. This man's um, heaving the lead. An early description of the hornpipe comes from the actor Durang, who left a very detailed description of his stage version of the dance. There's a wonderful video of Wayne Sleep doing an interpretation of this dance. So would you like to play that, um, that video, please? It will be the first video on the list. Uh, Heather, do you want uh, me to share it or would you like me to share the link so people could watch themselves? Uh, we've probably 
haven't got time to show it. It's nice to see it in context. Um, okay, uh, let's try. Um, As you like. If it doesn't work, we'll move on. I would need to stop your sharing to start sharing myself. That's the downside of that. Are you okay with that? I don't mind. Yeah, I don't mind. I apologize, it might not work very well, but the link is in the chat, uh, guys. So if you want to see it later in the better quality, <laughs> please feel free. <laughs> feel, feel free. <laughs> Alina, there's Elena, there's no sound. No, maybe it's not working so well. No, 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 no. I just okay. Oh, you just have I, to um, share sound. Give me a second. Oof. Okay, one more time. Sleep impersonates John Durang. I love that. I think it's great. <laughs> so, uh, do I need to share my screen again or will you do that? Uh, no, I uh, you need to do it again. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, here we go. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Mm, sorry, just give me a moment. Here we go. So that was um, Durang, there he is. That's the, the original. And uh, he's left that wonderful description. 
But this is um, probably a, a more uh, sensible view of what the hornpipe looked like. This is just a common sailor dancing. Um, the hornpipe became so widely accepted throughout the 19th century and into the early 20th century that it was included in the repertoire of nearly every dance school throughout the Western world. It was taught to boys and girls. Here's a, a photo from the early 1900s. This is a young lady in Melbourne. Um, and it's still part of the Highland repertoire today. This is a young lady in, in New Zealand. Um, and when they standardized Highland dancing um, across the world, New Zealand stayed separate. They had their own version. So they still have a lovely um, different version to the hornpipe that um, other places dance it. Um, I believe it's still taught to naval cadets in some places, uh, but they, but mostly sailors don't. Like I, I know a number of sailors, and they, they don't dance a hornpipe. That's for sure. So, in conclusion, uh, dancing has always been strongly evident in mar maritime history. People have always danced because it's fun. Throughout history, people have also recognised that it's a healthy activity. On board ship, it was an important way to while away the long hours when there was little else to do. It lifted the spirits and enabled people to forget their cares. So saying, this is just as relevant today as it ever was. It's still a wonderful way to, to lift our spirits and, and do good things for our well-being. Um, I've carried out extensive research into the culture of music and dance associated with Captain Cook, and you can find this on my website. And we've also developed a, an education unit for primary schools um, that's particularly geared to the Australian curriculum, um, though that is changing. They're sort of writing Cook out of the, the things that they should teach children these days. Um, and the music we play today is from our CD that recorded last year, 2020, so that's available too. Um, on the website, you can also read about dancing on convict ships. And if you're in Australia, you'll be able to visit my exhibition, Dancing in Fetters, The Culture of Convict Dance, which is to start a national tour next month. The other element that I've studied in, de in detail is the sailor's hornpipe. And I share this interest with Simon Harmer, and we're part of the INSTEP research team, which supports this type of research. I'd like to conclude um, with a video, uh, but we maybe we'll save that till later. Maybe might just put the link on. Um, Simon uh, um, constructed a um, he produced a video for the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich um, for their Sea Speak um, program. Um, I'd found a description of a hornpipe from a street dancer, a sailor who was a street dancer in London in the 1850s, and he was called Whistling Billy, and he gives quite a, a nice description of the hornpipe. So Simon took that description and he, he made a modern um, interpretation of that, which is just lovely. He lives near Portsmouth, so they, they filmed it um, there at the harbour. So if we put the link in, that would be easier than, than trying to show it now, won't it? We'll, um, we'll put that in, but do have a look. It, it's really lovely. So thank you, everyone. That's, um, that's the end of that. Presentation, Dancing on Deck, A Maritime History of Dance. Thank you.